from the cloud and just gonna click. We are officially going live on Facebook. We officially have 950 registrations as of now. So we're looking forward to an exciting Ooh. session. Okay. Okay, we've just gone live. Gone live? Okay. Uh, do you do you guys see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay, super. I just need yeah. to. Perfect. Okay, super. Just a second. All right, I'm gonna. If you're all okay, we are good to go. Broadcast. And we start letting people in. Okay. All right, guys, all the best. Thank you again for joining us. It's good. Looking forward to an exciting webinar to all of you. See you then. Bye, Arvin. Hello, if you want. The attendees are coming in. We'll start in another couple of minutes. Seeing someone sits in the submarine. We see people joining in. That's great. Fantastic. We can start. Yeah, it started. People started joining in. Yeah. Just give it one more minute. We just crossed uh, 300. Okay, um, shall we start, Isha, and then we will allow yes, people please. to join in? Yeah, awesome, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome to Technal Facade webinar series. This is episode three, 
facades for high-rise buildings. It gives me great pleasure to uh, see you all again on this uh, another edition of our facade webinar series. This is our third edition. We completed our first edition on digitalization of facades. We covered sustainability. And now we're coming to a very exciting topic, something which uh, I'm really passionate about and the team here at Hydro also extremely passionate about is uh, high-rise buildings. Um, today we have with us a fantastic panel. Uh, with me, there is Douglas Sum, who is Associate Built Environment from Oricon Facades. We have with us Luis Miguel, Project Director from B6 Facade, B6. And we have uh, Dr. Verna Yager, who's Technical Director of uh, Hydro Building Systems, and my colleague Isha, who is heading marketing communication from Technal India. Um, Hi, everyone. Will, without further ado, I will just quickly start off today's session. Uh, firstly, a big uh, moment of appreciation to all the frontline workers who have taken on this uh, huge mantle on them uh, to helping us uh, tackle this COVID situation we are all facing. A big thank you and shout out to all the uh, medical staff, all the people who are in the um, uh, uh, food and beverage industry and so on. They have been fantastic. And thank you everybody for staying at home and we salute all the people who have been involved in this. A little bit about Technal for people who are uh, new in this space. Technal is a Hedro brand and as Hedro, we have uh, five business verticals. We have our own bauxite and alumina plant. We produce our own energy, uh, which we convert the uh, streams of rivers in uh, Norway. And that's how uh, we make a very clean hydroelectric energy. Uh, we also have uh, a business interest in primary metal. We have our own roll products uh, division and we have our extrusion division as well. And the hydro building systems comes under the extrusion business portfolio. And under extrusion business portfolio, we have extrusions, we have precision tubing and building systems. This is where Technal belongs to. Technal as a brand, we celebrate our 60th year anniversary this year. We are present in more than 70 countries along five continents. We are worldwide leaders in aluminum glazing systems. Architects like to call us our partners for the most complicated challenges and we like to specialize and we are known for our innovation and design expertise. In terms of building envelope solutions, we offer from sliding systems to windows, doors and facades and not limited to only standard architectural applications. We also make our own uh, product range. We have for fire-rated doors and windows and facades, bulletproof, burglar-proof sliders, windows, doors, and facades. We have shops and office partitions, verandas, solar protection, railing gates, and fences. So that was a quick, brief introduction about what Technal does. And coming to today's topic, facades for high-rise buildings. The, let me give you a quick uh, synopsis of why this topic is so important to us. The United Nations says that 68% of the world population is projected to live in urban areas by 2050, which means that two out of three people will be in urban environments in the coming years, which means that spaces in cities are going to be more compressed and, and what we call as densification of the city is projected to happen. And probably the only way to address densification of cities is to build tall buildings. And that's something which is what we're gonna to address today. And I've got a fantastic panel of speakers, more than 100 years of expertise on this room. And without further ado, I would like to invite our first uh, speaker for the day, who is Douglas Sum, who is the Associate Built Environment at Oricon. Douglas has more than 15 years of global facade engineering consultancy experience and also been involved as a contractor. He has undertaken world-class projects globally and is particularly interested in super tall towers such as Burj Khalifa and the most recently uh, known project which is the Dubai Creek Harbor Tower. His recent interest is using the advanced technologies to redefine facade engineering practice. And most of all, he's a fantastic human being and a great, great, knowledgeable person. Without further ado, I invite Douglas. Uh, the floor digitally is yours, Douglas, over to you. 
Yeah, let me mute, unmute first. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you, Elvin. And then uh, let me share my screen for the presentations. Yeah, so maybe you can uh, let me let me do so. Yeah, all right. So, so let me just try to share my screen. Yeah, here we go. And so everyone can see the PowerPoint, right? Yes. Yeah, good. Okay. All right. Hi. Hi, everyone. Is, um, my name is Douglas, and uh, today I'm talking about the design and uh, construct of the facade for super tall towers. Yeah, so we are not just a high-rise building. Yeah, so we talk about the super tall towers. Yeah, I think it's, um, uh, very soon is, uh, Elvin is going to send out a poll is, um, seeing how the people doing the, uh, 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 what's the, what's the maximum height that you have been designed for your buildings. And then uh, let's see the, let's see the poll results. And then, um, so, so my team, yeah, here we go. Yeah, so uh, uh, host cannot be open. Okay, fine. So um, let me just try to take this means. And then uh, my, my team is uh, used to be uh, doing a lot of the high, uh, super high rise buildings. Yeah, such as the one that you see here. This is the Shanghai Towers. And then uh, my, my global team leader, Mr. Steve Daniels, is being get involved in this, uh, um, the Malaysian, this Twins Towers. Uh, myself have been uh, working for a very long time in the Burj Khalifa. And then, uh, so uh, this is the profile of the of the uh, of the Oricon team working with. And then, uh, like Alvin said, is uh, our team is uh, working very heavily in the uh, Dubai Free Cover Tower. And then, uh, yeah. So uh, hopefully, we can uh, we can make it ongoing. Um, however, today, if you want to listen more about the uh, what's going on of this uh, Free Cover Tower, how the design look like, etc., today I'm not going to do anything regarding this tower. So it's, uh, it's, our answer is no. So uh, don't ask me anything regarding that thing. And um, if you want to talk about these things and uh, maybe not now, but uh, uh, once we got a fun, a good time, we can buy me a drink and then we'll see how, how it goes. Yeah, but today we are not talk about this building. Right? But um, I am be more than happy to share with you guys um, how um, when the time that we're dealing with all those super tall towers, uh, what's the funny experience and the very uh, uh, fun facts that I have facing this uh, by dealing with this, this, this stuff. All right, so the first thing is, of course, it's designed for wind. Yeah, so it's uh, the taller of the building, the more critical of the wind load to the buildings. Yeah, this is uh, quite obvious. And then uh, maybe you, uh, 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 the, the wind, is, why wind is a very, very, very scary to, to the high rise building because of uh, one of the most Difficult things is the is the vortex after it's a, after the wind pass through the buildings and then you can see is anyone can see my browser yeah so I saw when I'm moving moving in the in the in the PowerPoint yes yes you can Good. see okay, yeah so so the vortex is uh, becoming unstable to the to the whole building yeah so that is the um, uh, that is the all the designers want to get rid of that so uh, so all right if we are a facade consultants sitting next to an architect, what advice that was telling them? Okay, the advice number one is uh, if you want to go for a super high rise building, instead of having a super sharp edge at your corner, that is uh, creating a very strong vortex at the, at the back, you should be getting uh, some round shape or maybe some chamfer in order that one, so you already can reduce a lot in, in terms of the uh, vortex at the, at the corner locations. Yeah, and then uh, for the another another funny way of doing these things is um, when you are doing a facade design for super tall buildings, you will never go for a uniform shape, starting from the bottom to the top look exactly the same. Yeah, because of uh, because of the wind load. So what you uh, uh, um, so instead of uh, doing this, what you can do, you can do something look like look like this. Yeah, and then uh, by having this arrangement. Instead of having the uh, the vortex, the, uh, the, uh, the drag force is starting from the solely on one directions, and then uh, that will be by the wind flowing in this things, and then uh, the uh, you have the vortex in here, you have the drag in here, you have teaser in here, so you can play around with these things, and then you can fool them in order to they are they can kind of counterbalance each other and eventually minimize the impact. Yeah, so this is the. The first two tricks when you are dealing with the facade uh, 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 for super high rise building. So when you're thinking of the, um, go back to the super high rise building that we just built, say for example, the Shanghai building and then the Burj Khalifa. 
you can see something very similar as well. Yeah, that edge is always having different shapes, and then they are always why why the super tall towers always twist things. Yeah, first of all, they want to uh, the architect want to show off. Yeah, but the second thing is a is twist because they want to uh, get rid of the of the wind load issues. All right. So this is the um, uh, the another one which is I want to talk about is the is the materials that we should use. All right, and um, in here I would like to um, we uh, not we define is uh, try to define the wind load. Uh, uh, what's meaning wind load on buildings? Wind loading is not the uh, the the air pressure applied on a building. Yeah, it's not a wind blowing to a building. No, it's indeed is the building behavior when there's a wind blowing to it. Okay, so what, what does it mean? That it means that if your building shapes is different, if your building materials is different, if your structural behavior, if the stiffness of the, of the building is different, the wind load on the buildings will look different. Yeah, here we go, we have this example. Uh, 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 yeah, wind surfing, yeah? So by wind surfing, you want to catch the wind as much as possible. That's why you designed it in this way. All right. However, if you are thinking of to having the same size of this wind server, but uh, having doing by a by a fish net, you go you you cannot catch any winds at all. Okay, so the entire thing doesn't move. Yeah. So so the uh, so you have a pref, uh, you have the perforations of the building can help the wind notes a lot. So I'm now going to tell you one examples of these things. Yeah. So when you have a building here, and then you have this a plan. Yeah. And then you have a wind blowing in the one directions. And then similarly, if you are a pass through a, a corner like that one, you will creating a, a drag box here. So you have a wall vortex here. This is creating the instability. All right. So uh, right now we have some, some idea. What if we are creating a perforations at the corner? Yeah. So what it means the wind somehow will be passed through the corner. Yeah, without having direct impact to the to, to the building. Yeah, that's why this is super high rise building. You're always seeing that you will see the uh, the perforation panels in, in in most of the locations in the Burj Khalifa, in the in the in the in the pinnacle on the top areas. All the panels are indeed perforated panels, and this is the reason why. Okay, all right. We talk about the uh, the uh, the winds acting on that thing, and then we have another where it's, uh, it's also talk about the wind as well, but in the totally different aspects. It is the stack effect. What's that? Yeah, so you uh, maybe you guys uh, also hear about the chimney effect as well. So we talk about something similar. All right, what does it mean? We are trying to look at the local climate here, yeah? And then uh, when you are having the very hot temperature outside and the inside is uh, relatively cold, so if you're having a long chimney from the top to bottom, say for example, no matter a chimney, or maybe you have a, 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 a lift shaft, so what are you going to do? You um, the the hot air coming inside the building is cold. Go to this uh this chimney, and then uh, because it's cold, and then it will be become heavy, and eventually they will drop to the very low end, and then uh, they will be accumulating the, the all the air will be accumulating here. So what will happen? The first the air pressure is here is very high, such that when you open the door here, that the whole air will be burning out. This is the first one. The second one is um, since the air is coming out, the, the air on the outside will be keep coming in. So it's uh, becoming a, a airflow between the top and bottom. Going go like this thing, non-stop. Yeah, so uh, the higher of this building, the higher of the uh, temperature difference, and then the more severe of this, of this effect. So I'm going to illustrate to you, yeah, what's how, 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 how difficult of these things. Yeah, so when you look at this, uh, this, uh, this little boy, See how this little boy doing, yeah. So, um, so this this boy is in, in Canada, yeah. So when they try to open the door because of the temperature difference, the whole air is uh, blowing in front of him, yeah. But you haven't you, you can see that the air is uh, coming inside, yeah, because of uh, the outside is very cold and inside inside is warm, yeah. So it's a kind of a totally reverse of the of the uh, 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 from the environment uh, than us, yeah. But uh, this uh, this is super fun, yeah. So how can you get rid of that? Yeah, first of all, you can build doors, many doors, yeah, so many doors in order to stop this air to be to be passed by, yeah, to, to stop the air. Okay, let's let's go for this one. Uh, this is a very typical office building as an example. If this very typical um, office building want to become a super high-rise building, and then if you give to me, how can I go to decide the doors? 
eventually I will put so many doors here and then uh, that will be having um, uh, so many of the air, air seals. So I have uh, one in here, you have two here, you have three here, and you have four here. And then uh, the, uh, again, the, the tall of the building, the higher that you, you should have. If you want to see how it goes, and then you can be go to the Burj Khalifa, you can, um, you can go to the lift shaft of, the, uh, of going to the uh, atmosphere, and then uh, you can see how many doors that you need to pass through. If not for the security, if not for the beauty, you're standing here to say hello to you because of they want to stop the wind. Having said that, when the, uh, when the, when the lift uh, door open, you still can feel the wind blowing in front of you immediately. So, uh, so yeah, we are, we are doing a super high rise building. What if the door still doesn't help? And then, uh, and then I will still creating this chimney effect. So what you need to do, you will need to creating a better door, a better door to a point that you need to have a submarine door. Okay. And as a matter of fact, I have been designed a submarine door for a particular location of my super, super tall building. Yeah. Can you believe that it's a five locking system and sure this is totally sealed. All right. Yeah. So after talk about the stack defect, we are talking about the, uh, uh, the differential movement. Yeah. So what is meaning of the, yeah. So the, the building is breathing, it's moving, yeah, all the way along. Yeah, this second is in here, the next second is uh, in the another way around, yeah. So, um, uh, to give you an information, is uh, one of the uh, uh, bu uh, tall buildings in Hong Kong. Yeah, I, I'm from Hong Kong, by the way. So, um, uh, which was built in the 90s, yeah. And then uh, when these are uh, moving at the very top, when they move, the record height that they move is uh, three meters, and that building may be just uh, maybe 300 or 400 meter high. So when you can imagine our super tall building, yeah, which is building right now, is uh, how much magnitude that is uh, they go to move horizontally. So so what is um uh, what is the movement that we are talking about? What is the differential movement that we're talking about? Here it goes. Is uh, the first thing that you need to take care of is the if the life low. So when you can imagine this is a building, yeah, not super high rise, but it's uh, yeah. So as uh, someone in a penthouse is uh, doing a, a great party, yeah, wave, yeah, this bang bang bang, you uh, keep jumping around, yeah. But at the same time, underneath you have a baby sleeping underneath, yeah. Of course, it's acoustic issue. It's not talked about here, but if you're having a such kind of scenario, what you can think of is uh, this lab is keep moving up and down. However, this lab is not moving at all. What if this glass? is not allowed for the movement. If it's not allowed for movement, these things will be crushed to here and then we will be creating breakage. Okay, so this is the differential movement of the life load that we need to talk about. The next thing is uh, talk about the wind because we are super, super high rise building. So when the wind blows, the, um, the whole structure will, will be blowing like the this tree. Yeah, so it will bend in a very, very smooth, very smooth curve and then blow in this direction. As uh, of course we blow in another way, we will go to another direction. So how can our facade can deal with that? Yeah, so, it's, uh, so it's, uh, we come back to this train. Yeah, so when I having this as a content page, it's like, uh, yeah, we are doing the facade while we're talking about a train. Actually train, how, it, how they can turn a curve is just exactly the same how we do it in the facade. What we need to do is just to make this train looking in this way, and then you will understand what they're doing. Yeah, so in between the train that uh, in each uh, compartment, yeah. So they are rigid, yeah. So you cannot bend this, uh, bend, bend this uh, compartment to be to, uh, to be different shapes. But in between, you have the flexible joints that allow you to be expand and contract. So here we go, uh, and that thing is called a stack joint, yeah. So in here, you can see one of the uh, uh, one of the stack joint design in uh, one of the super high rise building, and then you can see the buildings, uh, the the stack joint keep going up and down. Up and down. I'm sorry. Yeah, up and down, up and down. In order to, in order to make this to be moving up and down, in order to accommodate this uh, differential movement, the higher of this differential movement, the bigger of this stack joints have to be. This is in, this is the way to deal with the entire building moving left and right. All right. Yeah. So you, uh, if you think of another thing out of the train, you can think of a caterpillar. Yeah. How the caterpillar move? You know. You know what I'm talking about. The next thing is, uh, yeah, so right, right now I know how to deal with the moving now, yeah? But uh, how can I deal with the very sharp movement? What is the magnitude of the movement? So in here, I can't, I can't stop myself as an engineer. I need to show to you some mathematics here right now. Yeah, so let's, let's see about the curve, yeah? And then um, the underneath is talk about the, ro the floor rotation ratio. What does it mean? That means that this is the, the, the floor 
when it is um, when it is um, the swaying, the building is swaying, that the floor will be rotate in a certain angle. All right, and then the and then the y axis is the height. So you can see uh, when it's uh, becoming higher and higher, the rotational ratio is becoming higher and higher, which is expected because when you are doing with this curves going this way, the um, uh, the floor supposed to be bending is uh, accordingly. However, you can see that it's not perfectly smooth. Why? Because of the uh, the stiffen uh, 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 the structural stiffness of the building is not different. Maybe on the base it is relatively strong, but on the top, since the building is uh, going to be smaller and smaller, and then the top, uh, the stiffness is not different. So that's why you can see some some kink in here, and then you can see something not smooth in here. And I'm now telling you that is uh, the, the, why why the building is changing the stiffness. Yeah, the shape is the uh, one thing, and the another thing which is very important as well is uh, uh, when you are having the mechanical flaws. So you have a really a relatively um, uh, uniform um, uh, 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 stiffness, but since that you have the uh, the mechanical equipment that the step floor have to be particularly stiff, yeah, and then I come to that one, and then eventually you come to another another scenario which is um, having a typical floor so it will become flat, and eventually you have another one just becoming stiff again. So uh, so uh, when you're having this sharp change, that's the location having the maximum differential movement. Yeah, so when you are dealing with the uh, movement report, the first thing that you, you need to look at is uh, where is the uh, mechanical flows and what is the rotational ratio in between the flows. And this is the first thing that you need to look at. All right. After the movement, we need to talk about the fire, yeah, which is the most uh, hottest topic in this, uh, in, this, in this industry. Yeah, I'm trying to put uh, a fire on a tower, which is uh, quite a lot in, 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 this, in, this, uh, in this region, but uh, it is uh, too disturbing. So uh, instead, I'm putting a barbecue fire here. All right, so uh, barbecue fire is not, is, not the, uh, is not afraid. And even the fire within the building is, uh, is, is OK as well, because you have, uh, you have a very good fire systems. You have the firemen coming here to catch the fire for you. So yeah, no worry about that one. But uh, people is particularly concerned about the um, the uh, uh, the facade or uh, the fire on the facade. Why? Because basically the facade outside you don't have sprinklers. Yeah. So if there's a fire just running and then it's going to spread, nothing can stop them. This is the then then uh, everyone just can stay there. Nothing can 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 go about that one. Yeah. And then uh, and also the firemen basically cannot go outside the building to catch the fire. So what they only can do is just to watch the fires burning. In order to get rid of that, yeah, so this is um, the local fire cook already having so many uh, guidance of telling people what to do. As the easiest approach is uh, having the uh, fire test. There's a lot of fire tests happening. The most famous one is uh, NFPA 285, which is uh, well recognized to be an acceptable fire uh, test performance for the facade. And then, uh, yeah, so this is a setup. This is how it looks. But uh, definitely, that the, that the facade will not be look exactly the same in every single building. Yeah, so what you need to do, you may be doing something um, uh, non, non typical, and then uh, you are tailor make the facade system in order to suit. Okay, yeah, so um, actually, uh, uh, for me, uh, having the fire, uh, I cannot say it's fire rated, I can say it's a fire tested curtain wall is easy. It is not difficult. But I would say the difficult handling with different people to about the same topic is the most difficult for me. Yeah, uh, I try to illustrate how long that I need to take in order to take that thing, but since the time that I, I, I need to make the presentation faster, but um, you can imagine that you need to deal with the fire consultants, the fire lab, the facade consultants, you have the uh, uh, civil defense and you have the clients and you have the architect, everyone having different agenda, talk about the same topic. This is absolutely look exactly the same of this picture. All right. So the uh, the next topic I want to talk about, yeah, I think is uh, moving very fast. Yeah, is talk about the design for installations. Yeah, we will go for the super high rise buildings, and then uh, you always go like this: the structure go first, and eventually the cladding go afterwards. And I try to describe this relationship. It's like a couple of a man and woman. Yeah, this is um you cannot be too close. If you're too close, that you are stopping the structure to remove the popping, and then uh, the structure, the, the structural guys will feel a little bit unsafe. Uh, it's um, it's not it's a bit uh, um, uh, uh, not safe. Okay, yeah, be, uh, yeah. So, but however, if you're too far away, 
and then uh, you cannot catch up with her so the uh, so they cannot allow the proper platform for you yeah and then even to one scenario remember that what i said in the when you talk about the wind um uh, the cladding when you're having the perforation panels is helping the uh, helping the building to reduce the wind i have even had one scenario of uh, if you're having a concrete core without a cladding that that building will become unsafe yeah is that we even have a study of that so so the so the relationship between the structure and cladding during the construction is so uh, you have to be managing very carefully like your relationship all right so the cladding how can you deal with this yeah so you can be either uh, 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 you can lift the whole cladding on the on the platform and then you install on the uh, on the on the slab one by one or you go by the material hoist or maybe you are having a better way is uh, having the mono well to install one by one but those are, are good for the typical building but not for super high rise building yeah it's uh, for the super high rise building i will go for a superman approach what does it mean Yes, so Superman is uh, very good. Yeah, it's, um, but he's only having two hands. So how can he saving a lot of people? Yeah, so, the, uh, so if this is a tower crane and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and the car is the structure, my cladding is this little man is a thing of free ride. Yeah, so the Superman as a tower crane is uh, to keep lifting up uh, of, the, of the building. This is the last tower crane of the super high rise building. Yeah, and then uh, when it's trying to become higher, higher, and then uh, you can see the you can see the one in the middle of the court. This is the pinnacle, all right. So when you come to the certain point, it will stop, and then uh, that thing will be sitting here. And then uh, they will be start installing the cladding on this pinnacle. You think of like a chopstick. Yeah, I'm a Southeast Asian, so we talk about chopsticks. Yeah. So it's a chopstick. You install the cladding on the chopsticks, and then you start lifting up your pinnacle or chopsticks. You, you continue lifting up and then you keep installing the cladding on the top. So eventually the things already on the top and then will be going to the higher. Yeah, so you, uh, the cladding is riding on the free ride. Eventually these things just uh, keep going up, keep going up, keep going up. And then eventually you just fix this pinnacle back to the structure. And then this, this Superman can go down and finish his job. All right, yeah. So, so this is the way of doing this, uh, dealing with the super high rise building as the last, last bit. Uh, of the of the between the structure and the cladding, all right. Yeah, the next thing is uh, moving very fast. Yeah, this is the design for operation. Uh, make it super fast right now. Yeah, and then uh, so uh, everyone knows that when you talk about the facade uh, cleaning and and uh, maintenance, you are having the BM uh, the BMU building maintenance unit. It will be very easy. To, no matter walking on the on the roof or maybe you are uh, going on the roof to put the cradle downwards or you're hiding your BMU inside the building and then uh, just open the door and then peeping out and then doing these things. But there's uh, so many uncertainties happening. Say, for example, what if the date is uh, the BMU machine doesn't work? What if the building, uh, building BMU machine is uh, working too slow that you cannot serve the purpose? Yeah, what if this BMU machine working in the middle of the building and it's not functioning? Yeah, there's so many things is uh, uncertainty happening. So what you need to do, you need to have a plan B. This plan B is, no matter what, you still need a Spider-Man, yeah? So just get prepared that you will have a Spider-Man, which is the upsellers, to be ready to uh, maintenance your building. Yeah, they are not the first options, but there is an option of doing this. All right, this is the last, last part of the building, yeah? This is uh, when you do a super high-rise building, you need to design for awesomeness, yeah? This is not uh, just for residential, it's not just for a, a, a tower, it is, um, it is the people that are proud to be here. You think of the first caliber, is indeed to the letting everyone to be proud of their in Dubai. Yeah, so you need to design something great. Yeah, so what is the mean, meaning great? Yeah, maybe you can have some uh, 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 glass floor that you can let your kids to be standing here to show that they are very brave, uh, they taking some selfie, or maybe you can uh, ask your boyfriend to, uh, to scare him yeah, uh, on, the, on the glass floor. But I think the most of the awesome, area, uh, awesome move is that you are inviting your guests, your VVIP guests, to go to the very, very top of your building and let them to take a selfie there. Yeah, so like a, be a Tom Cruise. Yeah, so this is this the way that I would uh, do. To close this, um, to close this uh, presentation, I would like to say, yeah, Tom Cruise is uh, really cool. They go to a Burj Khalifa and takes this, um, uh, takes this screenshots. But I think it's uh, even people become cooler is the guys who's, uh, who have uh, built this job. Yeah, you, 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 you see, it's, um, no matter how you can write your name on, on this Burj Khalifa, 
but uh, indeed, what you can uh, you cannot do is that uh, you erase those people who are writing their name on the outside of the pinnacle, eventually lift it together to that place. You have no chance of cleaning that. This thing will stay there forever. All right. Yeah. So if you if you build a super high rise building, yeah, to take away is you you you, uh, you take a pen when this pinnacle coming up. Make sure that you sign on it. Okay. Yeah. So. All right, this is my presentation, and then hope that you enjoy it. This is a bit too short, but hope that you enjoy it. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Douglas, for this wonderful presentation. Um, I just take this chance to also share with you some of the uh, poll results. Um, while you were speaking, I did two polls. Uh, one on building height experience. Uh, we have 44% uh, of the audience saying they have experience between 50 to 200 meter tower followed by um, about 50 meters is 21%, uh, 200 to 300 meters, 20%, 300 to 500 meters, 8%, 500 to 1,000, 5%, you might know them very well. And more than 1,000, there are 2%, there are five people in the audience who have done more than 1,000 meters. I'm sure we all know what project they are working on. Um, in terms of uh, profession, uh, the room has today 27% Architects, 13% uh, uh, facade consultants, 7% developers, 7% uh, main contractors, 17% facade contractors. We have 4% from the academia, students, and the rest of the supply chain is about 20%. So this gives you a quick um, thumb rule of the kind of audience we have today. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Douglas. Uh, a shout out to all the panelists. Um, we are taking Q&As uh, through the Q&A tab. Uh, there is a Q&A tab available on your screen to all the attendees of the webinar. Feel free to drop in your questions. At end of today's session, we would go back and Isha would help us to moderate our Q&A session to all the panelists. So thank you so much, uh, Douglas. With that, I would like to uh, now invite our second speaker, uh, our very, very dear colleague, Dr. Verna Yaga, who is the Director, Technology and Marketing at Hydro Building Systems, uh, from August 2017, Vernayaga took over the position as Director of Technology and Marketing for Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, DAC, at uh, Hydro Building System. He is known in the industry and in the environment for more than 25 years. He has held various positions at Hydro Building Systems. He's also at the executive board, heading a lot of companies, research, and development departments. Uh, his specialty and his favorite topic is building physics, and he analyzes um, building envelopes and simulations with a focus on sound and aeroacoustics, heat and moisture protection. So without further ado, for the city of the future and building envelope evolution, I hand over the platform to Dr. Werner. Dr. Werner, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Arvin. Just a brief question. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, that's great. Yes. So, uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, greetings from Germany. And I hope every one of you uh, has uh, a safe place and uh, is really taking care and possibility to take care of the beloved ones. And looking forward how this crisis uh, is not giving us uh, further issues, but even makes us all stronger in that industry supporting also in, in a lot of areas, the future development of buildings and especially of high-rise buildings. Um, in the next 20 minutes, and I just press on my, on my watch just to understand it right. The next 20 minutes, I just want to go briefly a little bit through some key findings, at least we as Hydro um, and together with uh, the colleagues uh, Technal in Middle East did alongside with all these activities and uh, giving you a little bit of flavor about our work when it comes to the further development on the envelope, on the curtain rolling, and everything which goes by this. Okay? So next slide should give you a little bit of flavor about the different topics uh, the engineers, and I guess Douglas was doing a perfect, perfect uh, introduction into that topic, what the engineers of an envelope should take care of not even today, but also uh, especially for the future. Um, we have seen a lot of things coming alongside and we will also discuss a lot when it comes to the inner city activities. And you see here, more or less my, my pinpoint going into this air quality in these big cities of the future and the activities all around. And I will touch on that one, especially also on the wind loads as Doug, Douglas did, because this is also for us when it comes to the stack joints, when it comes to the fixations, a pretty important way 
of dealing with the things uh, when it comes to the envelope design. Uh, not only because of COVID-19 time, uh, but a little bit uh, close to this. We are triggered a little bit by the question, how will the high-rise building of the future look alike? Um, we, we have seen a lot of single function, uh, either it's an hotel or it's an office building or, or um, but the combination, I'm pretty sure, could become a little bit more what is requested by the investors in the coming future. At least what we have seen today is that you need a grocery store if you are just uh, more or less grounded in, in your flat. Um, what about your office space? Do you have to travel? Is it feasible to make uh, residentially more or less your home office? Is it working properly? So I'm pretty sure we'll see a lot of activities in the future to rethink, rediscuss more or single function buildings uh, in the building industry. And, and this makes it pretty interesting for the engineers, but also for us for the curtain rolling. Because in my flat, in my room, today it could be a grocery store, tomorrow an office, the day after, even a flat where the people want to live and live secure inside. On the right hand side of the chart, you see on the upper part, um, all the cities with this more than uh, 10 tall buildings realized. And more or less, this is a little bit giving us and indicating us in addition with the lower right hand side graph, this is just from May 2nd, this is where we had uh, the most cases of uh, COVID-19 um, during more or less May uh, the 2nd. So the question is, when this kind of pandemic could uh, come back again, what is the solution for us in building industry when it comes to high-rise buildings to cope with the demands of the user, home office equipment, uh, having grocery stores, having even opportunities to take care of the kids? Will this impact the design of the curtain wall and we believe strongly, yes, it will. Uh, furthermore, when after that, um, we have discussed in Germany a lot about CO2. I mean, maybe you have heard it uh, around the globe, but Germany will introduce a CO2 tax uh, coming soon from the 21st uh, of this year. We'll start a little bit and next year it will become even more. And the idea is to tax CO2 emissions by at least 50 going up to 125 euros or US dollar per ton of CO2 emissions. Question to us was, how was COVID so far impacting the CO2 emissions on the planet Earth? Because this is part of our strategy, how much is more or less the, the increase of CO2 emissions uh, changing the climate and the wind loads as Douglas stretched out. And what we find out is that uh, when it comes to this kind of information, so far available, the global pandemic of COVID-19 will have a significant drop of CO2 emissions. But when it comes to the total picture of the CO2 emissions, which is on the left-hand side, it will just be a 6% drop off. So not too much uh, to question whether climate change could happen and will happen. I mean, we will have a significant drop by CO2 emissions, but I'm sure the 6% will not change the current tendency. And I hope most of you support more or less our point of view, climate is on the move, climate might change immediately. Not really, but it will change over the past, uh, or over the next decades, surely. Um, this is more or less the indication what has happened in the past more than 100 years. On the right hand side, you see from uh, uh, Hawkins, the situation about increase of the temperature on planet Earth starting from 1850 until 2016. So we are pretty close to this 1.6 degrees Celsius increase of the climate compared to 1850, so before the Industrial Revolution really started. And we are at the moment closer and a little bit above of 1.5 degrees. The overall tendency is to stop being not above two degrees. We'll see how much this can work out, but we need technology and proper solutions to make it right. The picture on the left hand side, you see the planet uh, Earth uh, in uh, colors from bluish to red. What you can see here is the color of the oceans, which become more and more yellow. Um, it is said that above 27 degrees water temperature, the likelihood of hurricanes, typhoons is dramatically increasing. So what we can see out of this uh, climate change activities is we will see more heavy loads on the coastal lines, and we will also see much more wind loads and gusts coming out of this perspective. 
When we look into this kind of map, uh, just posting a little bit the, the latest high typhoons and uh, hurricanes of the last seasons, you see immediately that the coastlines are, of course, pretty much uh, endangered by this uh, increasing of temperature in the oceans. But nevertheless, I also printed you, this is from Europe, the map, and this is the European Observation of Storms uh, Institute. And everything you see here, which is marked greenish, yellowish, and or red, is already a hurricane from the classification F0, F1 until F4. So even in Europe, the climate movement and also the, the climate activities of changing, having higher wind speeds, is really a matter of fact. And this means we have also have to change, especially also in Germany, our way of looking at windows on curtain walls and the envelope because the wind loads become much higher than we have expected so far in the past design phases. Um, already mentioned by Douglas, the vortex of a building is extremely important to analyze properly. The cosmos by the shape of the building, especially when it comes to this traditional rectangular way of making high rises, we will see wind effects and pressure fields, suction fields, we don't want to have uh, for a stable construction. And we have to make changes in the way of we have maybe designed in the past years, the facades and the curtain walls. We have to see also that uh, the question about tightness cannot be taken out of this discussion. So it's a static issue. It is a aerodynamics issue. But in addition, it's also a tightness issue, not only uh, against rainfalls, against air from the inside moving to the outside, but it's also against dust coming from the outside into the inside. Because if we see more drier summers, we will have much more dust in the air. And with the much more dust in the air, we have to make sure that the dust is not penetrating the envelope and the envelope design. The facts, more or less, uh, and I just make it like that. In Germany, we have, I mean, it's just uh, to give you a great uh, background of the German way of dealing with uh, wind loads so far, which will change dramatically, I'm pretty sure. We are just grouped in four different wind zones. And what you can see here is that the major layout, what we are doing in Germany is before class nine and 10. So more or less the static pressure is okay. It is close to 600, uh, close to 500, uh, 600. So this is pretty simple and can be really understood as being digestible and easily performed during the past uh, developments. What becomes much more interesting is when it comes to the tornadoes. You see more or less the F1, 2, 3, and 4 tornado and the static pressure on the curtain wall. And in addition, I mean, that was stretched it out. With the wind speed, we don't only have the standard standard wind pressure, it comes also the gust in addition and the height is also giving us an increase of issues on the curtain wall. So on high rise, you do it naturally, nothing goes without having a wind tunnel testing or at least uh, upfront a pretty, pretty good intense CFD simulation just to minimize the pressure fields on the curtain wall. And according to this, also minimizing the loads bearing things going into the structure from the wind loads. When it comes to this kind of wind effect, of course, it seems to be a bit uh, stupid to change to thinking about natural ventilation. It will not work everywhere, of course not. Um, when I think on UAE, you have extremely hot summer days, so it will not make sense to make natural ventilation in UAE during summer period, but maybe during the winter time, still there will be some cozy uh, nights where you might think of switching off the aircon and moving into natural ventilation mode. What is the advantage of this one? The question is, do you want to have more or less permanently filtered air or can the quality of air outside provide having natural ventilation and by this also reducing the energy loads of a building? So far, so said, the buildings uh, in the global aspect are cause, root cause for 40% of the CO2 emissions. So everything which can reduce the CO2 emissions can lower the impact on the climate and by this also maybe can slower the heating up of uh, the planet Earth and by this reducing the wind loads. We prefer nowadays in tech now a lot thinking about on high rise and sliding options. Why? The slider is giving us a pretty, pretty good way of openable and ventilation area possibilities while not projecting to the inside because if you have a turn and tilt window the turn window projects to the inside and takes away 
precious, very, very precious rental space. And this we want to avoid and can avoid by sliders. Is the idea stupid, high rise and slider? Maybe, maybe not. In London, we did in total three towers, uh, the two Guardian Towers on the left hand side and the new Fundland Tower in the central part of it. And there we have introduced for the first time, uh, we call it a pool slide solution, which is called with our commercial name Tigal. The idea is that the inner sash is projecting to the inside and then is slowly moving left and right. And by this, a slider is possible to be done without having very, very deep constructions. And of course, by not projecting as a turn window or door to the inside. And this was three times developed for high rise buildings on the project base before we took it into our standard solution. The advantage here is that you really can open for natural ventilation purposes. And even so, if you have high wind loads, there's a kind of a special position of that slider that you just have micro ventilation. So more or less the sash is just lifting off some four or five millimeter frame, giving us the possibility to have across and around more or less the sash a complete openable gap and by this naturally ventilate late and the slider is still in the closed position. In addition, the technical team in uh, Middle East uh, thought about something even more coming to the ground. The one is the pull hand slide, I just shown you, which is a brand new solution. The colleagues of Technal Middle East, they developed and tested a new slider, which is called Technal Performance P70. And it's a real slider construction, giving us much more opportunities for opening as uh, the beforehand Tigal pool slide. What is important to know is that it was the measured uh, watertight until 600 Pascal and the wind loads we have tested more or less up to 3000 Pascal. And if you just remind yourself, 3000 Pascal is one of the bare minimum activities you have to think on when you really want to go for the high rise and to reduce the deflection on, on our structure. And of course, also on the loads on that one. So sliders, natural ventilation are feasible, doable at high performance levels, giving us the opportunity at least in some period of time, Germany even more than UAE, to switch off aircon and to have natural ventilation from the outside under the assumption that the air quality outside is in a shape that you really want to have it ventilated from the outside, of course. Furthermore, as said before, the vortex design as Douglas stretched out is extremely important. And this makes it even more necessary for us to cooperate with the architects and the engineering offices, because when we come to the real design of an envelope, which is not rectangular, which is not straight cut, uh, which is more or less like here a scrutin, uh, screw design, we have to discuss pretty intense with this kind of uh, experts to make it proper when it comes to the profiling and the units to be designed fit. Here you see the Doha uh, control tower in Qatar and together with Friedemann, who was more or less the lead uh, planner and designer of the curtain wall, it was feasible to design a kind of code banded solution for this kind of special shape of the building without thinking to have banded glass. So lowering the cost by having code banded Having more or less this, that, of course, you have to go into the uh, simulations again, because the pretty most important part is that you really design the cold panda glass, that this area, the space area, is not overstressed by the cold bending activities. So this is something which cannot be done like that. You need an engineering department uh, from Friedemann and other experts from the glass industry to really make it like that. From our side, the profiles, you see it like there. It's uh, definitely one of the more uh, sophisticated and uh, normal things we also use here in Europe. It is not the male-female as in the US, it is uh, the female-female solution. And here it was just a 3D tre a pre a treatment of the two-dimensional but length-shaped profiles necessary to make the shape of the frame in a proper way without bending the frame. We just had cold bended the glass on top of it. So it was pretty easy and simple together with the experts from the planners to make this happen. Another cross section, you see here, in addition, the cross section horizontally, you see more or less the central uh, settle gasket, we call it like that for the drainage part of the activities. And here more or less also as said by uh, Douglas, 
the stack joint, how much movement uh, is more or less uh, necessary. This is always the first question in the engineering phase. The flexion of your slab, how much movement do we have to accommodate? And we have made uh, solutions accommodating movements up to 40 millimeters. Um, and this is also something which is really tailored. It is bespoke solution, making it really happen to make it better for the building. So it's a bespoke solution, but it's feasible and it's rooted more or less on our standard solutions so far. Another one also very important uh, to discuss is uh, to have these shapes, and I've just seen it beforehand. Uh, the Dubai up-down tower, it is also, according to our definition, shaped to minimize the wind loads, especially on the corners. I mean, easily and super designed and uh, explained by Douglas. And also here for us, very important is the request on the air infiltration, 600 Pascal, water penetration, 1000, and the design wind load is plus minus 4000 Pascal, or 400 kilogram per square meter. So this is pretty, pretty heavy. And in addition, introduced here is the certified slab of the fire stop, which is also going from the floor to the floor to protect against the spread on the activities. Some cross sections on here, uh, because I guess also very important uh, to see a little bit the cross section about the sloped area. And you see it also, I mean, it is also straight rectangular profiles being able to be combined. It's the female female solution once more. You see here more or less the drainage part in the central uh, joint area between the units, just to be able to get more or less as much as possible of uh, condensed water or uh, rain to be uh, shipped to the outside to make it happen that it works fine. And you see also the console or the, the joint to structure area, how to bring more or less this kind of weight of that tall building into the basic structure in the back hand. So it's straightforward unitized solution. Uh, structural ceiling glazed, as you see before. Um, it is also without corner connectors. It is straight connected uh, to the profiles. So it's also something which is really, really easy. Unitized, you know, it's uh, simple. You fabricate in the workshop, ship it by the truck, and then you lift it in a fast manner. Back again, coming from the wind loads, I also want to stress now a little bit more something which goes into our latest development areas. And this is the sustainable area and the comfort area of the users. How can the curtain wall, the envelope really support making this happen, that uh, we, we make it smoother for the comfort inside? And then when I say comfort inside, it must also mean for us as engineers in the future for the comfort at the outside. We have seen in the walkie-talkie building in London, that light reflection is impacting the city landscape if it's more or less uh, um, forgotten to design it in, in that way. So we always have, when we make a high rise building, have to think about accommodating buildings uh, in the neighborhood, about the, the streets uh, being around that. Is the comfort still there or do we have to think about something differently, making it even feasible? The trends, at least here in Europe, is going to go straight into more reuse of already done solutions. Reuse is, uh, for instance, for these projects in Copenhagen, the Redouvre Tower, it was a prerequisite uh, pre by the customer and by the architect to use 40% of recycled concrete. Um, and said this, they also want already today to design for more multi-purpose use. So they want to have a building which can be an office building in one area. Tomorrow, it could be a residential flat. The next day, another field, maybe a cinema, maybe a grocery store or whatsoever. So this is really, really coming, this kind of requests. And in area where you have at least uh, some rain, gray water use here in Copenhagen was also requested, maybe also for the roof terraces and the other terraces to get water done. Circular economy, and this is definitely part of our major strife, uh, said this. You see here green roof uh, top gardening on the upper right hand side. You see a project we are just realizing at the moment in Oslo. It is called the Ocon Portal. Uh, on the top right hand, it is uh, the project uh, also of uh, Techna Middle East in Kuwait uh, from the Kuwait Oil Company. And also here we are using a new material. Uh, you might think aluminium is aluminium is aluminium, 
But as we are really thrilled in the company by the sustainability and by trying to minimize our impact on uh, the climate change, we have uh, really gone through a lot of development steps before we had this uh, material, which is called hydro -circal. Circle means circular for circular economy and AL at the end is aluminum. What is the advantage? The advantage is that compared to the world primary average, which normally per one kilogram of aluminum, you release 12 kilogram of CO2 emissions. The new material is releasing for one kilogram of aluminum, just two kilogram of CO2 emissions. So the impact is six times less than if you use a standard aluminum uh, with the same properties. If you even don't care about the energy aluminum is produced, it could happen, for instance, also in Germany, that you produce it with coal. And if you produce aluminum with coal, it is not 12 kilogram CO2 emissions, it is 20 kilogram of CO2 emissions per one kilogram of aluminum. This was the winning argument for the architects, dark architects in Oslo, to take our curtain wall system in Silkai for the building project here. It was the same argument we took it here to Kuwait. And what you see in the Kuwait area as well, they also integrated a lot of photovoltaics. On Ockham portal, they have terraces, they have more or less the rooftop uh, greened. And in addition, what we are planning these days as well, we have our own area, which is just dealing with greenhouse design. And the greenhouse design is now to be designed for high rise buildings, because greenhouse means also you can have some more or less fruits growing, plants growing on top of. And this has to sustain also in heavy wind loads. This is something we really go into this deep, deep thinking. When it comes to greening the curtain wall, I just also want to flip into two projects we are currently doing from the R&D side. The one is together with Sobek, Rana Sobek, architects and engineers in Stuttgart, together with universities in, uh, in uh, Germany. What is the idea? The idea is to have a kind of collector in which you have an algae compound and the algae compound is producing bio, uh, more or less biomass. And uh, in addition, the opportunities of that kind of solution is to have carbohydrates and lip lipids produced in parallel. Um, it seems science fiction, but uh, BMW, this is the car manufacturer in Munich in uh, Germany, they have given us the green light to have the first test mock-up facades integrated, which will be in the range of uh, 300 square meters uh, in, in height, in, in, in width, sorry for that. Um, so it will be 300 square meter in total where we put this kind of collector and also the way of producing this kind of biomass inside the facade is something we are really trying to find out how the vertical envelope can evolve from just fixing a glass beforehand fixing your photovoltaic in the vertical manner, now maybe even in some parts fixing a biocollector, uh, which is producing biomass and uh, this kind of opportunities for the future. When you see it on the left-hand side, that the design is more or less flat. On the right-hand side, you see the design becomes more three-dimensional. And to accommodate this request by Zubek and the architects, uh, we also jumped into another project and this is 3D aluminium, not printing. Um, this is uh, part of the activities here in Europe uh, from the University of Delft together with Darmstadt, plus the companies mentioned as source on that page, including a metal builder. What we did is that we have developed and we are going to certify the way of printing a 3D knot um, and then combining it with aluminium uh, length profiles to enable us to have a three-dimensional way of uh, designing it to accommodate more or less the collectors, but also for other purposes. Because if you know, uh, on, on a straight glass area, you have a lot of sound reflection. If you can tilt the surface, the sound reflection goes more into sound dissipation. So also a three-dimensional design of the curtain wall will help us to have more functionality, less solar intake, for instance, less solar reflections into the city centers and further activities can more or less be covered by that. So this is something we really uh, intend to finish this year to bring it also into the market. 
And to a certain degree, we also realized this already. This is a smaller project, not really a high rise in, in UAE, uh, but at least a high rise above 20 meters is stated in Germany to be a high rise. And we did it like that, for instance, already in a project in Munich, which is called the Atlas Tower. So this is really something we go deep into this discussion, how we can really make a three-dimensional 3D printed knot to have not only flat glass surface with rectangular framing, but also to project to the outside, adding more functionalities for the curtain wall in the near coming future. Okay, the next uh, evolution is of course, and discussion is about how to tighten it. I mean, this is a structural ceiling glaze solution. And this is definitely maybe also something we should say in areas of higher dust loads, we have to really go into more in this direction. I took out some data from uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, this is a picture of Dubai, but this is the graph of Saudi Arabia. What is pretty interesting in this graph here is uh, the microns, so the dimension of the fine dust particles is going smaller and smaller, the taller the building comes. This is clear. The bigger dimensions will be on the lower sides uh, due to the weight. And you have fine dust particles lower than 2.5 microns. So going completely into your lungs when you go for high rise buildings. Of course, when this kind of loads appear, you must have a pretty, pretty tight solution uh, just to avoid that this micro dust is coming inside. And uh, by this maybe causing asthma of the, of the users of the building, of the owner of the building, of the residents like that. So it is something we really have to think in the future. And there's no standard, at least I know no standard, which is requesting us to test the tightness against dust from the outside to the inside. And this is something we should work also all together in the future on project base. Finally, the last slides uh, to finish the presentation from my side is that the curtain wall of the future, especially as Douglas has pronounced and spoken out quite clearly, the high rise aspects uh, due to the more dense city centers will come but for us as engineers, it is a super perfect opportunity to have even more functionalities integrated in our verticality. So far, we have a little bit of PV, we have a little bit of glass here and there, we can do much more. We can integrate panels for absorbing sound, we can integrate greenery, we can integrate, you have seen algae uh, collectors, we can project three-dimensionally to the outside to minimize sound effects in city centers and so on and so forth. So I'm really looking forward how this building industry is evoluting even further and the envelope will become even more important in the coming future, especially in the high rise. Uh, said this, this is the end of my presentation, giving you a little bit the background about what can COVID-19 really impact in our industry. And it can impact that we will have multi-purpose buildings, high-rise buildings in the future, which is great. Uh, I really appreciate it. will have some advantages and challenges to us as uh, curtain wall designers. We will see more solutions integrated in the vertical curtain wall, and we will see more three-dimensional evolutions of the building skin. We will go beyond the square way of building high-rise buildings, I'm pretty sure, and I'm looking forward uh, for that as an engineer. Thank you so much and have a great, great afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Werner. Thank you very much. And in fact, the audience agree with your, your uh, vision. 74% of them believe that uh, post-COVID, we would see more and more mixed-use, multi-purpose buildings. So that reaffirms uh, what you have just uh, presented today. Uh, we're going to, we have a lot of questions pouring in for both Douglas and you. We will take it later on. Um, thank you so much once again, Dr. Werner. Uh, with this, I would like to now um, quickly invite our next uh, presenter. So we heard now from a facade consultant's perspective on how the tall buildings uh, are, are working and functioning. Uh, we heard from... Uh, uh, Dr. Werner, how from a system uh, point of view, how Technal and Hydro building systems are envisioning the future. But let's talk about the reality of today's situation. We have with us uh, Luis Miguel Montero, uh, project director at B6 with more than 24 years 
of construction experience. Uh, he is an experienced project director, operations manager, and aspirational COO with a demonstrated history of working in high rise construction with several major projects delivered. He has a global executive MBA from INSEAD, and also he's an architect from the University Lucero of Lisbon. With that, I hand over the stage to you, Louis. The floor is yours. Uh, Louis, sorry, we need to unmute okay. you. Yeah, okay, perfect. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much, Arvind. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, thank you, Isha, Hans, for your uh, creative approach, and Douglas, for your uh, um, detailed approach to engineering, and Arvind, for, for putting this all together. Uh, I hope um, everyone uh, is uh, keeping themselves safe in this, uh, in this difficult time. Um, we here on site uh, are trying to do our best to keep uh, ourselves, our consultants, and our and, and our labor force um, as, as safe as we can as we can maintain, considering considering the circumstances. Um, I would also like to thank uh, our um, team of experts in B6 facade, um, which uh, has been making this project possible with uh, with internal expertise, particularly Tom Moons. Andre Muller and Damien Crosley, one of our PMs, and Pierre Wang, our side PM, they have been um, they have been uh, to the top of their expertise um, in order to 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 help us to to coordinate all the facade works and make sure that we that we have a successful project around here. Uh, as as you've seen before, uh, Yep Town Dubai um, is a super high rise building with with 340 meters high, 78 78 floors with around 200,000 square meters. And, uh, and as Hans said, in accordance with the future, uh, we are divided between offices, hotel, and residences, and some, uh, some small commercial places. Um, we accommodate in this project um, uh, about 44,000 square meters of facade, mainly in unitized systems with approximately uh, 8,500 panels. Um, Arvind, if, if you can put the second slide, please. Um, yeah, so um, I, I will talk to you a little bit about the general contractor's perspective. And, and if you can as well put the first pool, which is about productivity in construction, would be great for the audience, uh, because that, that will bring us uh, to, the, to, the, to the final pool, which is mainly about uh, productivity and efficiency in construction. Um, as, as a general contractor, um, we have to rely on the team of experts that uh, that provide that provide our design expertise and make sure that uh, that we coordinate and integrate all together. Uh, in every successful project, um, we our main goal is is to make sure that uh, from a very early stage um, we have we have a collaborative approach from um, from our clients. Uh, and we managed to integrate consultants um, through the, throughout the design uh, throughout the design stage. Um, managing to in to integrate consultants throughout the design stage will allow us um, throughout the process uh, to create an optimized logistic and methods in order to make sure that w when everything is planned and coordinated, we have a seamless installation and avoid wastes um, throughout the construction process. Um, in the middle of this, um, the off-site construction plays uh, an ever-increasing role uh, in nowadays, from the facade systems to the, to the, even to the concrete systems, to the, to the steel and rebar and everything we can manage to design and engineer um, to, be to, to be built off site and brought into site um, will play a, a massive role um, in terms of uh, the optimization of the efficiency and productivity. Uh, if if that, that all becomes pretty simple, um, when, we have, when we have to test and commission, a, a building that has um, that has been um, planned in accordance with these three main principles with a, with a, with a coordinated with, a, with coordination and integration. 
Um, we in B6, um, and particularly on this project, uh, have tried to take a, a very proactive approach in what regards to the introduction of digitization in our productive process. Uh, one, one, one of the very important um, uh, aspects of, of digital integration is uh, when we go through the, the design, engineering, uh, procurement, construction, testing, commissioning, and handover, um, we, we are dealt with hundreds of thousands of activities uh, which have to be uh, properly planned, coordinated, and have to be uh, perfectly integrated in order to be able to be sequenced. Um, in the past, uh, we have we have used um, uh, from 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 uh, simple from simple spreadsheets to Excel to all sorts of pivot tables in Excel in order to be able to understand where we are. Um, but that that was always uh, that was always uh, falling short in what regards to having information in real time. Uh, in, in in this project, um, we have de decided to take a, a particularly different approach by integrating a fully um, integrated beam project with with Primavera P6 with three um, uh, digital platforms, three different startups that we have. Uh, integrated in this project, which which I would like to introduce, and I'm, and I'm always very proud uh, to introduce and promote, because I do believe that um, digitization is uh, is the future of improvement of uh, efficiency in construction. Uh, in, in our case, uh, we have implemented a German um, a German platform um, called Sablono, which I first met in London with a couple of construction companies. Um, which allows us to integrate uh, the whole engineering and construction process in one single platform. Uh, that means at every moment in time, uh, we have live information of the status of our engineering, the status of our procurement, the status of our construction on site, and even the status of our um, QAQC and testing and commissioning. Uh, so, so be because it's it's a, it's a widely spread uh, tool, um, allows us to know at any given moment in time where are we, and this allows us to integrate with um, with the economic control of the of the project uh, at the same time as we integrate with planning as well in progress. So directly from Sablono, we update our Primavera and from our Primavera then we'll update our uh, economic control of the project. Um, it is proven to be, it is proven to be very, very successful and uh, a big advantage for our team. In, in addition to that, uh, we are using um, as well a, 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 dig, uh, um, a digital um, um, logist, uh, logistic platform which allow us to, at any given moment in time, uh, know what what is planned for which logistic um, uh, uh, for, for which cranes we need to use, which which yards we need to use, for which um, types of material are they approved, are they not approved? Um, so allowing us to to have a fully integrated uh, approach to logistics uh, from from the moment that we load at the supplier to the moment that we have to install it uh, on site, we have full tracking of the system. Um, and, and last but not, but, but not least, and then going back, uh, going now to, to, to WakeCap. Uh, WakeCap um, is um, a, a, um, another digital tool, which is a geolocation tool, which allows us to know at any given moment in time where every single uh, stakeholder and worker is on site, allowing us to have um, crowd um, monitoring uh, in order to understand if we have uh, above a certain number of people in a certain in a certain designated space. Uh, we are using it uh, right now for the COVID-19 proximity cases in order to to um, to trace and to avoid crowds in certain areas. 
um, and optimize the the the, um, the the logistics around the workers because we need we need to take care of every single one of our of our workers um, on, on on a project like this where we accommodate three and a half thousand men. Um, so the integration between all these tools, and I would ask you, Arvind, if you can if if you can place the the second pool. Um, uh, it is extremely uh, important for us um, in order to go towards the um, improvement of our um, uh, productivity and efficiency. Um, and this is this is mainly this was mainly to to summarize a bit of what is the the general contractor's approach um, to high rise building buildings, particularly. Um, when having the, 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 the facade expertise in-house, uh, how can we integrate everyone? And, uh, and as well, how can we um, improve efficiency through the use of the new technologies? Uh, in, in this second pool, um, uh, this, this works as a, as a challenge for, for the audience in order to, to, to see from, from from everyone, how, how do you see uh, the improvement on the construction efficiency? Um, so my intervention was uh, simple. That was about it. Uh, you are welcome to, to place any sort of questions that, that you would like. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Arvind. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, and I hope uh, everyone manages to, to, to keep uh, themselves safe. Thank you so much, uh, Lewis. Um, that was a very uh, interesting uh, viewpoint from a main contractor perspective and how we approach uh, building such a high-rise building. Uh, let me share with you, um, let me stop the polling. So uh, for your first uh, question, which you shooted out to the audience, um, efficiency and productivity, 65% uh, of the audience feel that the, the industry is somehow it's poor. Uh, has there is a potential to improve up to 30 percent on efficiency and productivity so majority of them feel that is still a huge potential to, to to change and on the other hand your recent poll a whooping 89 percent agree with you a combination of smart design off-site construction and the use of digitalization on construction process uh, that is really the way forward uh, in terms of uh, what the audience feel as well Thank you very much. So feel free if you have any further questions, uh, I'm at your disposal. Perfect. So I now uh, invite uh, Isha to uh, open up the Q&A session. And this way we can have the questions asked to our panel uh, and uh, share some ideas. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, the panelists. Uh, your presentations were really insightful. We've got a Good feedback on the chat and the Q&A column as well. So we do have a couple of uh, questions that uh, we can take right now, uh, seeing the time constraint. So we'll uh, start with uh, one question for the high rises. Uh, in general, if it's a super high rise tower and you have to design it for the wind load, uh, so how do you differentiate between the uh, different floors is the full tower designed for the similar wind load and all the facade has to be as per that or uh, what is the criteria how do you optimize the requirement to Douglas uh, to me yeah <laughs> okay all right yes. <laughs> so um so normally is uh, when you are designing a tower that you are going for doing the wind tunnel test so eventually don't you can have a you can map the uh, uh, the uh, the wind load to the entire uh, building in all elevations. Um, however, is some um, sometimes the people asking you to design both for the maximum wind load and apply to everywhere. Um, of course, uh, engineering wise, this is of course is okay. However, uh, that will be creating another issue, which is a, a wastage of the so many uh, materials. So my so my way of to uh, to do this way is to I normally. Okay, this is this is the experience is sharing. It is a, not a golden rule, but this is a kind of a experience sharing. 
I normally go for the, uh, uh, the systems that tend to take care approximately 80%, 80, 80% of the entire uh, uh, um, the facade area, such that this, um, I can use one, one system applied to all, which is uh, reducing all those uh, difficulties of the manufacturing, design, and then uh, installation, etc. But the remaining 20% that I can put in the stiffness in order inside the pole valves, in order to take care of that, and then to, to particularly address those uh, high wind loading locations. Yeah, so if you're asking me these things, then I will say go to the wind tunnel test, wind tunnel test report, and then uh, seek for this 80% coverage of the area which is applied for the wind. And then uh, for the remaining 20%, we have a different approach and uh, for the particular locations. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Uh, thank you so much, Douglas. All right, so we have more questions putting in now. I think we have very less time. I have a question uh, uh, here, here from um, uh, from Mr. Neeraj. He's asking, uh, depending on the, if it's a high-rise construction, and uh, this is for Dr. Eger, uh, we talked about whether sliders are really a good choice or not. But considering the space uh, requirement, as you mentioned in your slides, people do like sliders as they save the space and the ventilation is good. It's just posh to have sliders. Mm -hmm. So uh, how does it actually address the problem, uh, the situation at the high rises, uh, the draft? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, as I try to present, I mean, we did three high, high rise. I mean, 200 meters something. I mean, it's it's a mid-size high-rise compared uh, to the high-rise in, in uh, Dubai, for instance. But at least also here, the, the slider was the preferred choice by, by the architect and the planners. And uh, especially when you have the slider and the pull slide I showed beforehand, uh, when you have the option of having this micro-ventilation, so it is still in a locked mode, but you have the possibility to have a ventilation still, even so you have some wind loads there, it, it really helps to make this uh, thing possible. We also made another high-rise building in Germany, which is uh, called the Henninger Turm. In the Henninger Turm, it was a real terrace made and the terrace was completely glazed. So, so you have two doors as expressed by Douglas to minimize more or less the draft, uh, more or less the, the, the stack effect in, in that building. So that there are various solutions to make it happen, but the slider is, is the preferred solution when you really don't want to lose too much projecting area by having a turn window, a turn door, or, or something else, which is just coming to the in or to the outside. Okay, on the same uh, lines, we have a question from Mr. Jason. He's asking, on wind effects and natural ventilation based on your slide only, you mentioned sliders achieve 94% uh, mm -hmm. in the ventilation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how have you assumed uh, that? Uh, how, how did uh, you calculate uh, that? Character? The ratio, the calculation was pretty simple. You have seen I have three, four different opening devices. It was turned, it was tilted, it was pivoted to the outside. And the assumption for the simulation was always that the aerodynamic opening area is exactly the same. I mean, it means when you have a, a, a pivoted window projecting to the outside, you have more or less an opening area the aer aerodynamic opening area, and it was the same amount for the slider as for the pivoted one, as for the turn and the tilt window, okay? Of course, when you completely open a slider, much better air comes inside than through a tilt window, for instance. But the, the simulation was the same aerodynamic opening is applied to a slider, to a turn, to a tilt, and to a pivoted one. Right. Thank you, thank you, Dr. It was... Uh... Great. Uh, I hope, uh, Mr. Jason, it, is, it answers your question. And we'll take just, just, uh, just send an email. I mean, definitely. Yes, yeah. of course. I mean, we are always open. Uh, there's, there's still some uh, query about this. You can send, it, send out an email and we'll get the answers for you. We'll just take one more question and rest of all the questions we will try to answer. We'll send it across to uh, the panelists and they will answer the questions and we'll send the emails back to you guys, all right? So uh, another one, um, uh, 
was it was so Isha may have checking? come afterwards yes was just Isha, while, we Isha, while you're checking the question i have a question yes. for lewis sure. um lewis you mentioned uh, the importance of engaging the contractor at an early stage of the project um how many clients are interested to do that i mean is the client willing to do that step today um and, and how and what are the benefits of doing so um we, we we are living a very good example of that um and um our, our client dmcc took took that uh, that very smart approach by engaging b6 at a very early stage of the project and uh, allowing us to together with their design teams to propose solutions in order to not only uh, optimize the, the economical case, but as well to, to, to optimize the design all across the several disciplines. Um, th there are, in fact, some clients uh, that are willing to take that approach, to take an early engagement uh, with a contractor in order to, to have uh, a common advantage. Um, in, in, it depends on what drives um, and what drives the business plan. Um, if, if, if the business plan is driven by performance, it's certainly, it's certainly um, uh, we have a, a higher successful rate to engage uh, in anticipation, to engage in an early contractor's involvement. Um, but, but, but that does not invalidate um, even the fact when, when we are on price-driven projects. Um, because uh, engaging, t taking the risk to engage a competent contractor at a very early stage uh, provides um, very significant advantages to the um, to the construction process. Uh, because uh, many many of the decisions are, are are taken at a very early stage in the project, but uh, we have to live with them for four or five or ten years, depending on 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 how um, how the the, the the design and, and procurement and execution process is is tight enough to avoid the project to procrastinate. Um, if if we take the right approach right uh, right in the beginning, uh, we guarantee uh, or we have uh, guarantees is is is, uh, is a very strong word, but we have a much higher probability of of success from 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 all perspectives, from the design perspective, from the from the developer's perspective to make sure that the client gets what he needs um, to the contractor's perspective because uh, the process is much more controlled. Um, uh, when, when we have time to plan uh, and we have um, time and, and availability to, to design in accordance with the plan, we can engage the several parties with anticipation as, as we did with technology in this particular project. You were engaged at a very early stage. Uh, you, you were engaged even even before we, we had the project signed, um, right. which was uh, which was a very successful approach, and, and, and we are about to start to, to start installation of the facade with with, uh, with 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 no single problem. Of course, with the, with the usual challenges of uh, of um, of a super high rise building with integration uh, in between um, between several trades. But but it is it is a, a very um, strong factor of success. The, the, the yearly engagement of, of a contractor and the designers accordingly. Perfect, Lewis. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. so we have, uh, we'll take just one last question and I think it's relevant for all three of the panelists and we should address it at the right time. When we are building super high rises, say above 300 meters or even 200 meters, they are more or less the permanent structures. We don't expect a Burj Khalifa to come down anytime soon. So is the curtain wall designed today uh, is able to last forever and uh, design apart whether us as suppliers are able to you know survive uh, forever and if not we have to replace it how do the contractors how uh, make sure that it can be replaced oh, brilliant question can, can i can i can i answer the first 10 seconds as a general contractor Sure. Sure. As, as a general contractor, I have to say it depends. <laughs> yes, but do, do, do we live forever? <laughs> yeah, what's meaning forever? What's the definition of forever? Yeah. That's right. Let's, let's say one generation, 50 years. 
60 years. I think I like yes, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's easily uh, 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 let's let let me start first. Okay, you guys can snap my face <laughs> afterwards. Okay, yeah. So um, okay. uh, uh, we have to uh, when we do the design. I think for the contractor, it's more or less is um, uh, 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 doing the system. system. We always split into two concepts. One is called the design lifespan, and the another one is called the warranty. Okay, it's it's different things. Yeah. So think of an iPhone. Yeah, I. Yeah, I, I can always talk about examples. Yeah, it's, um, your iPhone have the warranty of one year, but the lifespan is supposed to be longer than one year. Yeah, maybe two years, three years, and then uh, but at the same time, if you are one year, one month, something goes wrong, and then say sorry, so it's uh, it's out of the warranty. Yep. So have to separate separate in these two concepts first. So normally the um, the warranty as request from the client side is uh, from 10 to 15 years because this is a kind of the a typical time that is the clients will be revisit of the of the purpose of the meet, uh, of this building and then uh, and then uh, all also is a uh, maybe 10 15 years yeah so it's a uh, uh, come on guys is uh, in this modern world you even don't know what happened after two months you know yeah so so 10 to 15 years yeah, yeah. is already kind of uh, too long Right, and then uh, but the lifespan, which is talk about the structural integrity of the building, as a uh, normally go for fifty years. If you go for the uh, the building like the Perj Khalifa or this kind of the landmark buildings, it will go up to a hundred or even hundred fifty uh, uh, years. So your yeah, the the structure and the and the component which is the structural structurally safe should be last for the same as the structure as well, which is uh, fifty years for the typical. And then uh, for the hundred and hundred fifty for a for uh, for extra, extra extraordinary buildings, but this does not including the ceiling, does not including the gaskets, is does not include the glass. So we are expecting to have to replacing them, but however that is a kind of the regular maintenance required to the to the building. That's why we need BMU. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I also ch just have two, two examples. Um, the one we did ourselves and the other one is for me the most famous uh, renovation. It's the Empire State Building. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I, I don't know who of you have been in the Empire State Building in the, in the past years. Um, it, it was roughly six years ago when I was just queuing to go upstairs. Um, and uh, there was just information about the renovation of the complete tower. And uh, I mean, the story is uh, a lot of nice experts came across and they brought up, up more or less 60 ideas to improve the efficiency of the building, minimizing more or less the costs. As Americans like to do, they like the Pareto principle. So uh, having 80% of results with 20% of investments, okay? And what they did out of the 60 ideas, they carved out five, okay? The first one was a new air condition. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Twenty-five okay. years old air condition, so they removed the old one, put in a new one. The second uh, version was beforehand by the floor. It was just one ventilation. They separated each floor in various segments, and every segment got individual air supplied. Okay. The third way, every user got a screen with a monitor. And on the monitor, he was seeing his current uh, use of energy and the bill at the end of the month if he continues like that. Okay. Okay. This was the third one. And now the curtain wall comes. The curtain wall is pretty old, 25 years, 9 millimeter uh, resin uh, insulation. Huh? So it's, it's low cost aluminum insulation. Huh? Um, but what they did is um, you have a spindle area. Behind the spindle area at the inner side, you have a radiator. They just put an uh, aluminum foil between the spindle area and the radiator, minimizing more or less the heat losses by radiation. So this was number four. And the last solution, they went into the curtain wall and they just kept the aluminum framing, removed the glass, opened in the fifth floor, a glass manufacturing. They disassembled the old glass, put in a foil of polyethylene called heat mirror, they made, so to speak, a triple glaze out of it and they reinstalled it. It will last for the next 25 years. And an, another renovation we just did currently was on the, the Munich airport. Munich airport terminal one is more than 40 years old. So the glass is 26 mil uh, double IGU. 
What we did is we kept the structure. We just removed the front plates. We even used the front plates from the stick system again. We used new gaskets and we put in a double IGU with a vacuum glazing at the outside. And this was the whole renovation of the curtain wall. So if it's designed for refurbishment, it can be done easily. If it's designed to take it off and make something new as a unitized, it can be done as well. So I, I follow Luis, it is yes, no, yes, but everything is possible <laughs> if the design is proper. Okay, but uh, say if I am building a big tower and I want my curtain wall to last 50 years, so it's possible the same curtain wall can last 50 years? At least what we did in Munich Airport is that it will last definitely the next 25 years and it was 40 years old. We just had to refurbish it. Okay, great. So great. I think uh, Mr. Michael Tang, this answers your question. So if, if at all things change, the situations change, the refurbishment or the replacement is always possible. The BMUs are the answer. So yeah. we have about more than 56 questions left. So what we will do is uh, we'll, uh, we'll just collate uh, them together. We'll send them across to you all, find your find time and answer the questions. And we'll share the answers with the ones who have asked them. I will, choose, yes. I will, I will try to do it in a bad time, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry with my point. <laughs> if, 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 you, if you will allow me to further do some marketing on my, on my mission, which is the improvement on, uh, on Productivity and efficiency. Um, mm -hmm. I, I had there were some questions about um, what are the integration tools that we are using. Um, the the integration tools that, that we are using uh, around the project is is a tool called Sablono. You can see it on my presentation. It's mm -hmm. a small symbol that that shows in the bottom. Um, and and uh, I've I've met uh, Lucas Albrecht. Uh, the, the CEO of Sablon, let's say two and a half years ago, when we were going through um, a, a series of innovation uh, forums where many companies were, were willing to start working with basics. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I made as a mission uh, to myself to listen to all of them. And, and many of them uh, could come to us and say, yeah, we can do, we can do anything. Uh, it's, it's data, it's zero, zeros and ones, and anything can be done, but very few. Uh, could prove to us that they, they were already doing enough in order to improve um, one of our silos. Because uh, we, sometimes we, we try to fall in the total digital integration without passing through the, the silo uh, phase. So we decided to take a silo approach uh, and, and, and resolve and try to improve in three particular aspects. Uh, we used Propagate for the logistics. They had a, uh, they had a platform that they were already working with Skanska in, in Poland, and uh, and they were part of uh, the Basics Accelerator program, uh, which which was being uh, promoted internally to use them. They are an external company. Basics doesn't have any 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 participation, but but a very smart tool, and which proves which proved to be the the core of our logistic team uh, right now on site. Um, in addition to that. Uh, Sablono, uh, Sablono, um, they, they came to us and, and, and at that time I remember I, I, I told Lucas that, look, I've been through so much, I'll have 10 minutes for you because uh, there are so many people trying to visit us that uh, it's impossible to have time for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, when they started presenting the, the, their tool, we, st we spent two and a half hours uh, talking about the potential of the tool and, and uh, immediately we, we booked a visit to London uh, to see uh, their clients and, and we saw one of the projects from, from Land Lease and another one from, um, from uh, one from Land Lease and another one from Mace where they were successfully applying the tool already. Of course, they were applying it on fit out only, but here we wanted to apply it on structure and facade and MEP and fit out. So we are taking a global approach to a tool which has been tested in a, in a silo. Um, and and that, that is, now the team can't live without it. And now when I see a, an Excel tracker, I uh, say, why is this not in Sablono? Why are we not implementing Sablono already with, uh, with, the, with the QS team, you know, the, to make sure that all the control is made in one platform and everyone knows everything. Uh, we know when one glass leaves the processor and arrives to the fabricator, 
and arrives to the site and is installed on site, glass by glass, from the 8,000 glasses that we have on site. So that, that's how efficient the tool can be. Uh, and, and you can imagine how difficult is, is, is Excel to coordinate all that and to have 10 different trackers all outdated and, and no one trusts the data. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a deja vu of, 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 of the industry. And, and, and then in a high-rise project, you, you multiply that across five major trades, like uh, structure, facade, MEP, and fit out, and, and uh, external landscape, and, and you understand the challenges that we have to go through. Brilliant. I could, I could continue forever. I mean, as, as I'm quite enthusiastic about, uh, uh, about thank you. Uh, di digitization integration. Well, thank you for picking out the question. I think that gives me a great segue to kind of summarize our, our views on how high-rise buildings will be constructed in the future. I mean, we had Douglas, who started off uh, today, talking about the stack effects and the movements and the importance of fire regulations and, uh, you know, designing for various uh, conditions and, and external threats which the building is exposed to. Uh, so Douglas summarized that extremely well uh, to know how a facade concern plays an important role to understanding those elements before the building is started. Then we had Dr. Werner, who, who segued into talking about the evolution of facade, the use of innovative material in this huge opportunity which we have in high-rise buildings, the use of biomass, the use of 3D construction, uh, using of recycled material like Sercal, helping in the carbon emission footprint, use of sliders to improve more natural ventilation on high-rise buildings. And then we brought things to reality with Lewis, who just, again, to resummarize what you said, I think digitalization is the key yeah. to success and to uh, engage the contractor and all the stakeholders you see in the table today, a facade consultant, architect, a system supplier, uh, involving them at an early stage, uh, and like how you very nicely put, really uh, works for both projects which try for performance as well as projects which are driven by budget. And making all this work through this wonderful digital integration makes a great success for building successful high-rise buildings. So with that, um, I, I would like to thank you all panelists for your wonderful insights. Uh, we had more than 500 odd people attending today's session. We're gonna send you all the statistics and data later on. Of course, as Isha mentioned, we'll have a lot of questions. Please, if you have time, it would be lovely to have your feedback. The email addresses of the people who have asked the questions will be there. So you can reach out to them directly also. And if you want us to reach out to them, would be okay as well. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, quickly show a little bit about what's coming up next in the Technal Facade series. Um, uh, subsequent to this session, we have next week, 11th of May, we will take on facade perspective on building fire and life safety. Same time, 3 p.m. UAE. Uh, we would like to also thank the AIA Middle East, the American Institute of Architects, who have been supporting this initiative and spreading this awareness around uh, uh, our architect friends in the region. So uh, stay tuned for this update. We will send you a link for this subsequently. Um, you will have all the videos recorded and it will be available on our Techna Live YouTube channel. So feel free to go ahead and subscribe and click on the bell icon to be notified when these presentations come alive. The last two editions are already up and you are welcome to go see them. Uh, when you close today's session, there will be a feedback uh, link popping out. So feel free to give us your feedback on today's session. It really helps us uh, to do more and more good sessions in the future. And uh, you have our contact details available if you have any clarification and question. With that, uh, one last closing word by all the panelists, and we will call today's session a close. So I'll start with Douglas, uh, just a line of uh, closing thoughts. Um, hopefully you enjoy my presentations and, uh, and then, um, yeah, so I will try to make everything to be having a good fun for 20 minutes. At the same time, you can enjoy the time of the uh, how to do the super high rise uh, design for the facade. So next time when you are dealing with these things and then you can think of the Superman, you can think of the train, you can think of the caterpillar and then, uh, and then you know how you deal with the, uh, the, the difficult contracts now. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Douglas. Dr. Werner. I, I just want to like to thank you, Arvind and Asha. I mean, the marvelous job. I, I have never experienced such, such some lively communication across the globe, so to speak, from India to Germany. 
Uh, marvelous job done. Thanks so much to be part of that uh, venue. Thank you so much. Dr. Lewis. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for uh, putting uh, all this fantastic panel together and uh, all this uh, creativity together. Um, I, I hope uh, that uh, our words were, um, were well perceived and um, Please, uh, everyone in the audience, uh, l let's do our bit uh, to, to, to move this industry from the stagnant phase that we've been living in the last, uh, in the last 50 years. Uh, if, if we go through the McKinsey report, which was issued in 1117, we should be ashamed of what we see, uh, that that the way construction is performing. Uh, so let's, let's uh, every, one of, every one of us do something about it. Uh, in order to make sure that um, we, we increase the value stick of, of construction uh, and, and turn construction uh, 40 to 50% to more productive. By the way, the, the, according to, to the McKinsey report, we can improve up to 40%. Uh, so I, I mentioned that we, we, were, we, were, uh, we could improve a little bit if we improve up to 30%. It's, it looks a lot, but, uh, but apparently the loss in construction is around 40% uh, of, of what we consider to be 10% of the world GDP. So it's, it's massive uh, what we have to improve. It, it will, it will, uh, it will reduce uh, or, or eliminate the infrastructure gap in the world if we would capitalize on that improvement. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Louis. Isha, closing thoughts. Thank you so much to the panelists and definitely the attendees. It was a real surprise having about 500 plus attendees and sticking to for the entire show. And I, for myself personally, the topics were very interesting and very insightful and the, the kind of questions that we are getting, it, uh, it tells that people are taking interest and uh, yes, uh, high rises are a thing to come and as the spaces are getting constrict, uh, more constricted. So we need to think about the high rises, sustainable way of constructing them and maintaining them. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Douglas, Dr. Tega, Dr. Montero, and Arvind. Thanks a lot for organizing all of this. And we'll see you next week again. Yeah. And Thank hope to all. see you, you all also as attendees. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank for you, sure. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Have we closed uh, for the uh, for the attendees? You no, know, it is uh, still here. Let me uh, stop sharing and then. So we're still receiving some comments. So. Mm. Stop live on Facebook. Okay.